from the city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez. America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the program. It is Wednesday evening, and the phone number, if you want to join us, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And the Supreme Court has accepted the case challenging the January 6th obstruction charges. This was um, what Jack Smith, the prosecutor for uh, the, the government, special prosecutor, who used to work at the Hague prosecuting war crimes. This is what he was um, suggesting should happen, and they've accepted it. The position uh, the position of the court is still unknown, but we are going to see exactly how this goes. Now, this is pretty interesting stuff here because while the Supreme Court is going to take up the January um, 6th um, case here, it's still uh, unclear how they're going to rule on this, right? So I don't know how that goes. I don't think anybody knows how it goes. But it's very interesting because what they're really going to be looking at here is can we prosecute Trump for what they're saying he's done here? Did he uh, obstruct an official proceeding? And uh, I don't think Trump was in that building. So I think that the real stretch here is going to be that they're going to have to say it's a uh, conspiracy and Proving conspiracy is very, very difficult, right? Um, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> to me, this this just seems like um, Trump's going to get a, a green light to go ahead and run for office, and they're going to say, oh, "We're going to look. We're going to do it later." And they're not going to prosecute him once he's in the White House, so they're going to. They might want to rush it and do it before he gets into the White House. You know, presuming he gets into the White House. But all of this is very, very interesting. Anyway, the um, judge, Tanya Chutkin, placed a hold on proceedings in the January 6th case against Donald Trump. Chutkin wrote uh, in an order today that an appeal that was filed by Trump's uh, legal team citing presidential immunity automatically stays, which means puts a pause on any further proceedings that would move this case towards trial or impose additional burdens of litigation on the defendant. On December 4th, Judge Chutkin denied Trump's motion to dismiss the case, arguing that he had presidential immunity. Trump has appealed the decision in the D.C. Circuit Court, while special counsel Jack Smith requested that the Supreme Court take up the issue, which they accepted um, uh, today, uh, as as I understand it. So, well, she's paused that they've accepted um, what they've accepted was uh, a different January 6th case, but which signals to me that they may be interested in taking this up, too. I could be wrong. They may, you know, you might get John Roberts saying he's not going to be the guy um, that's going to do that. But they did decide to take the uh, January 6th case. That was a petition from uh, Joseph Wayne Fisher challenging the Department of Justice's use of evidence tampering law to prosecute J6 defendants. And that's that's, uh, I think, uh, a step in the right direction for them to take a look at things. This was an order that came out uh, from the high court earlier today saying that they have granted the petition for Joseph Wayne Fisher challenging uh, the most widely charged felony for January 6th, which carries up to 20 years in prison. Fisher, the Fisher case is one of three identical petitions for case review by January 6th defendants who were charged with corruptly obstructing an official proceeding, namely a joint session of Congress convened for the counting and certification of electoral college votes. On January 6th, the Department of Justice had charged nearly 330 defendants and former President Trump with obstruction as of December 6th. President Trump was charged in August with several counts related to obstruction of the joint session of Congress on January 6th. A uh, grand jury indicted him for obstruction of an official proceeding, attempting to obstruct uh, an official proceeding and conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, amongst other counts. Now, the defendant on on the case here, Thomas Caldwell, who was tried in the same case as the Oath Keepers founder, Stuart Rhodes, and three other Oath Keepers, 
um, has asked the U.S. District Judge Amit Mehta to uh, suspend his sentencing um, until, or at least the hearing for that, until the Supreme Court resolves the obstruction case. So uh, everybody's kind of looking at the other to see where they go. And uh, I, I think this is just fascinating, personally. I think it's fascinating. Now, going back to the Trump stuff, I just wanted to kind of get, bring up the speed on the, uh, on, the, on the January 6th stuff. Now, Chutkin, um, she's also uh, in that kind of wait-and-see type of thing going on. She says that the court agreed to take up the case and fast-track the decision. If the jurisdiction is returned back to that court, it will um, do, you know, its duty, et cetera, et cetera, um, and stay on track for a trial of March 4th, 2024. However, that may not be the case, right? We don't know exactly how that's going to to pan out in this particular uh, situation. So um, very interesting. Now, the House of Representatives has authorized the uh, inquiry into Joe uh, Biden and uh, Hunter Biden as well. Listen to this one. So today, uh, the House voted to formally authorize an impeachment inquiry into President Biden. Now, what does that do? Well, that allows the committee uh, chairman to compel interviews, to obtain documents, and further uh, their case that he improperly benefited from his son's foreign business dealings. And um, good old Hunter Biden, he was making the rounds. He was, um, uh, let me see, where was Hunter Biden? He held a press conference, and he says that uh, MAGA Republicans have been uh, impugning his character for the last six years. Uh, he says that Republicans have no shame. They've turned a father's love into darkness. <laughs> what else he says? My father was not financially involved in my business. He reiterated that. Uh, so he's been really, really... Um, out there saying that stuff, but uh, let's let's listen to one clip from good old Hunter Biden uh, saying that the, it's the Republicans that are really after him. And um, listen to this. Cut one. For six years, MAGA Republicans, including members of the House committees who are in a closed door session session right now, have impugned my character, invaded my privacy, attacked my wife my children, my family, and my friends. They've ridiculed my struggle with addiction, they've belittled my recovery, and they have tried to dehumanize me, all to embarrass and damage my father, who has do devoted his entire public life to service. For six years, I have been the target of the unrelenting Trump attack machine shouting, where's Hunter? Well, here's my answer. I am here. <laughs> there he is. You know, it's funny. Back in, um, I don't know, maybe it was October of 2021, maybe, or 2020. Um, I think it might have been 2020. I, um, there was a, I, I had tweeted an article that um, the New York Post put out about something or other. And, uh, and I put, where's Hunter? <laughs> And that got retweeted by President Trump, which was so funny that he mentioned that in that clip. So uh, his answer, I am here. Yeah, he's here now, 2023. It's years later. Anyway, uh, that's some funny, funny stuff. Uh, we're going to get into a little foreign policy. We're going to get into a few different things tonight. So I want you to stick with us. We're also going to talk about what is the best state. And listen, I don't recommend this at all. But what is the most affordable state for you to get a divorce in? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Sadly, that there's people measuring that stuff. Uh, we're also going to talk about national security. We're going to talk about um, Zelensky, Ukraine, Israel, um, a little bit about what's going on with uh, energy. And, of course, the border is always an issue. So stick with us, folks. The phone number, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. And I wanted to continue our discussion on Hunter Biden. 
And I got to come up with a funny name for Hunter. But anyway, until we do, Hunter, uh, t- today uh, they greenlit the um, impeachment inquiry into to Joe Biden. But um, there was, a, a, you know, they, they were citing the uh, Hunter Biden dramatics as they did it, at least according to the New York Post article here. And I've got some uh, some clips of it. So Hunter was subpoenaed and and requested to show up for an interview in Congress today. He didn't show up. Uh, But then he holds a press conference outside the Capitol, kind of like a, I don't know, like a big FU, I guess, a proverbial FU, if you will. And Jim Jordan, uh, chair of the Judiciary Committee, he uh, had some comments on the lack of Hunter participation. Check this out. Or disappointed they didn't show up. I mean, he was just across the way at the Capitol. You think you could come here and set the question? If you do it in an open format now, you're going to get you're going to get filibusters. You're going to get speeches. You're going to get all kinds of things. Uh, what we want is the facts. And the way you get the facts in every single de- uh, every single investigation I've been involved in is you bring people in for an interview behind closed doors where you can get those facts. And then, as the chairman said, we'd love for him to come public. Finally, I would say this: uh, Mr. Biden's counsel and the White White House have both argued that the reason he couldn't come for a deposition was because there wasn't a formal vote for an impeachment inquiry. Well, that's going to happen in a few hours. We think it's going to pass. We think the House of Representatives will go on record with the power that solely resides in the House to say we are in an official impeachment inquiry phase of our oversight. And when that happens, we'll see what their excuse is then. They should have been here today, but once we take that vote, we expect him to come in for a uh, for his interview, for his deposition. And frankly, uh, we'll also, I think, look at uh, contempt proceedings as we move forward. So Jim Jordan says we're going to look at contempt uh, proceedings, holding Hunter Biden in contempt for being across the street and for not showing up for his um, closed door meeting uh, deposition and what have you. And uh, the House did, in fact, vote earlier today to formally authorize an impeachment inquiry into President Biden, allowing committee chairmen to, like I said, compel these interviews, get the documents and do what they have to do. Uh, The vote was straight down the party lines, 221 Republicans in favor of it, 212 Democrats against. And uh, Democrat Brad Schneider was the only um, member absent. Lucky him. Anyway. President Biden, um, you know, he denounced House Republicans saying that uh, this vote was something that they were doing to um, choosing to waste time on this baseless political stunt. Instead of doing anything to make Americans lives better, they're focused on attacking me with lies. Of course, that's how he feels. So now Hunter Biden um, had some stuff to say at his press conference across the street. Listen to this. There is no fairness or decency in what these Republicans are doing. They have lied over and over about every aspect of my personal and professional life. So much so that their lies have become the false facts believed by too many people. No matter how many times it is debunked, They continue to insist that my father's support of Ukraine against Russia is the result of a non-existent bribe. They displayed naked photos of me during an oversight hearing. And they have taken the light of my dad's love, the light of my dad's love for me, and presented it as darkness. They have no shame. Now, he says they have no shame. President Biden, through his um, his uh, press secretary, um, weighed in on that. And listen, uh, I've early on, I've said this. You can check all the tapes. I don't ever think it was a good idea going after Hunter Biden uh, and his drug issues. Everybody has that one uncle somewhere that's screwed up, right? Whether he drinks too much or, you know, he's he's a drug addict or whatever. You know, everybody knows somebody somewhere facing addiction. And whether you think addiction is a, a matter of weakness or, or a disease, however you want, it doesn't matter what side of the argument you're on. Point is, I think most people um, aren't going to see this as a, a negative on Biden. I think, if anything, it humanizes the guy. They're like, oh, the poor guy. First of all, he's old as dirt, right? And uh, now on top of that, he's got to deal with his, you know, very adult son into his 50s that, you know, has had these problems and carried on with these shenanigans. So I never thought it was a good deal. But 
KJP comes to the rescue saying, listen, Joel Baboso Biden, he absolutely loves his son. Listen to this. The president was certainly familiar uh, with what his son was going to say. And I think what you saw was from the heart from uh, his son. And you've heard, uh, you've heard me say this. You've heard the president say this. Uh, when it comes to the president and the first lady, they are proud of him uh, continuing to rebuild his life. They are proud of their son. So now <clears throat> Joe Biden and KJP are very, very happy. Um, the rest of America believes the lies that the Republicans are telling about Hunter. And uh, again, how do you believe the lies? He says they showed naked photos. No, sir. They showed videos that you left on your laptop on a bender. And um, these videos are very telling. Uh, they saw the videos because you created them. And th that's got nothing to do with me or Joe Biden or anybody else. That has everything to do with Hunter. Right? So, Hunter, that you, you, you made your bed there. You got to lay in it. Anyway, let's um, go to the phones real quick. Let's see. Uh, Dave, Mays Landing, New Jersey, W-O-N-D. Go right ahead. Hi, Rich. How are you tonight, sir? Doing wonderful, thanks. Uh, you know what? Um, I just wanted to say that uh, I really love your show. I've been listening to it for a long time. First time talking to you, sir. And I oh, thank also, you. Uh, would like to say that uh, I uh, I know a little bit of Spanish, not quite as much as you, but my friends growing up were my dearest friends in grade school. I'm 65 years old, so I'm going back a week. But they they taught me how to speak a little bit of Spanish. But when I hear you say Joe El Bozo by or El Bozo, El Baboso. I remember growing up there was a clown called Bozo. And I say Joe Bozo Biden. That's a very good uh, loose translation. I think it works really well, Dave. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. And I would also like to say when uh, you played the last clip very shortly ago about Hunter Biden and um, I yeah. am right here. I thought he might, he should have said, I'm right here in my father's basement. <laughs> That would have been funny, right? I'm right here hiding out where my dad hid out. But in reality, I mean, you got to give him uh, credit for for showing up and for being a contrarian. You know, honestly, that's a page out of a playbook I might use. If the Democrats were like, you got to show up and testify, I would show up and testify outside. So, oh, you want a closed door hearing? I'll give you a closed door. I'll do it right on the steps of Capitol Hill, right? I, I would do that just for, for the same reasons he's probably doing it. Uh, I mean, he might be doing it to, you know, cover a little bit. But uh, I would do it just to be uh, just to be a wise ass, you know. Why not? Uh, because you know, ultimately, a, a lot of these things are are hyper political. I think the Republicans are are, are within their rights to to ask the questions that they're asking. Um, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if Democrats came after uh, uh, after Republicans like they have in the past. So I could see you know me or somebody else uh, you know doing something snide like that. Anyway, Dave, thanks for your kind words, and I appreciate your comments. Uh, good thoughts and uh, very funny, by the way. And, folks, we continue with our discussion on what's going on in the world tonight. We're going to get to your calls as well, and we've got a lot more discussion to come. The phone number is 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't go anywhere. I am Rich Valdez, and we're coming right back. Uh, by the way, your ratings are up. Congratulations. I had somebody. It's always nice to check. I like to see, <laughs> even if they're friends, I like to see how are they doing? Are people listening, right? That's but right. You're, you're doing great. America at Night with Rich Valdez. Are you concerned that if there's no money, Ukraine could lose the war to Russia? Well, well that's always been a big possibility the whole time. I mean, I've, I've never thought they could win to begin with, especially the way that we eased into it. What are the implications that if Russia wins? Are you worried about the implications if Russia wins? Well, everybody keeps saying they're going to continue to go across Europe. I mean, they can't beat Ukraine on the eastern side. How are they going to continue to go the rest of the way through through Europe? I've never believed that scenario. I think it's, uh, I think it's a good selling point to send more money. Okay, that's uh, Senator Tommy Tuberville. 
uh, interviewing with uh, CNN on Capitol Hill yesterday, saying that Russia can't beat Ukraine, so he's not worried about them invading the rest of Europe. And um, interesting point for sure. Uh, my question to our guest is, is he is he on to something or is he not? Uh, and our guest is Morgan Ortegas. She's a former State Department spokesperson in the last administration. She's the founder of Polaris National Security, and she's the host of a brand new radio show on Sirius XM, the Morgan Ortega Show, which you can hear on Sundays from 11 in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. Morgan Ortega, welcome. Uh, hi, good evening. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. You bet. So this clip of Tommy Tumberville that you just heard, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I, first of all, I, I like Coach uh, quite a bit. I was actually with him in uh, Munich earlier this year at the Munich Security Conference, um, and I think he's just uh, fantastic. I think that the debate uh, that we're seeing about uh, within the Republican Party, at least, about Ukraine funding is, is, is an important debate to have because we're talking about billions of dollars. And I always start off the discussion with reminding people, how did we get here in the first place? And we got here by failing to continue the Trump policies. Remember, and again, I was Trump's State Department spokesperson, and quite uh, different from what the media narrative was selling you, uh, what was actually happening is we were incredibly tough on Russia. We introduced sanctions and other actions. Uh, you know, Trump dealt with Putin differently, obviously, than, than other presidents had. But his administration, we were tough on them uh, at the State Department. And in fact, President Trump is the one who first sent lethal aid to the Ukrainians. And we know that all of his policies were effective and they worked. And how do we know that? Well, because Putin did not invade on his watch. So he found uh, the, the right policy mix. And then fast forward, what happens? Uh, you know, President Biden, within seven months, Kabul is falling to the Taliban. Uh, Putin, Putin senses the weakness. And remember, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor still for President uh, Biden, uh, said that they were not going to send the lethal aid, which, again, I would remind your audience, the lethal aid that we sent to the Ukrainians in the Trump administration, he said, well, we're not going to send that to them and, unless Russia invades. So all of these signals uh, said to Putin that the team wasn't serious about it and that he really wouldn't pay a price for invading. And even since then, uh, you know, my problem with a lot of, uh, of how the Biden administration has, you know, conducted their support to the Ukrainians for the past year and a half, uh, you know, almost going on two years at this point, is that they slow walk everything. So the strategy just has never made sense to me. And I've been critical of the strategy, probably from a different perspective of, of J.D. Vance or, or maybe other Republicans. You know, I've been critical. I'm like, if you're going to give them aid, if you're if you're, if you're going to, uh, you know, try to help them, uh, quote unquote, win the war, well, define what the war objectives are, define what success is. And don't just trickle out the aid a little bit here, a little bit there. Give them enough to win. Instead, you see this policy that's just drip, drip, drip. And I think this half-hearted policy of always being of talking tough to Putin and talking tough for Russia but not acting tough, in my opinion, that policy has actually prolonged the war and why we're almost two years into it. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that at all, Morgan Ortegas. I think that uh, Biden's uh, kind of uh, appeasement uh, has really exacerbated this problem. Now, there's right. a lot of uh, you opened up with something that I wanted to follow up on, because uh, I agree with you that the sanctions and the uh, the treatment that Trump had with uh, Putin was was staunch. It was it was tough. He was he was definitely tough on him while still having respect and, and keeping peace. And right. there are a lot of people that will continually suggest that somehow Trump and Putin are best friends, birds of a feather. And the reason he didn't invade when Trump was president was because they're such good friends. And I don't see the logic in that. I don't know if you hear this argument or if you've seen it in the media, but it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, do you, what, what do you say to that? Well, it, it, you're right. You're absolutely right that it doesn't make sense. You know, the uh, Crimea... And especially Crimea, but parts of Ukraine are sort of existential for Putin in, in, in terms of like he wanted Crimea. He wanted parts of Ukraine more than he wanted his next breath. So the only thing that was stopping him is and you can I mean, I'm sure President Trump would would tell you and others. this. He's told me and many others this story 
is, uh, you know, President Trump said, no, like, you're not getting it. You're not invading. This is not happening, you know, on my watch. So it, it just makes no sense that this if Putin and Trump were such great friends, don't you think that, you know, he would have given him Crimea or given him Ukraine? That does, it doesn't make any sense. You know, this especially when you look at the history uh, of these two countries, um, Putin is. Uh, I mean, listen, he's not a dumb man. Right. And so he tests and he prods and he pokes and he sees how far he can get. Also, remember that Putin had a lot of experience with this team. Most of President Biden's team was was President Obama's team. Right. It's mostly Mm -hmm. the same group of characters. And the last time he decided to invade, uh, he did so when most of these people were in charge. So, you know, he thought that he knew uh, what would happen. Now, I do think that he miscalculated clearly. Uh, His army um, has faced losses that they did not expect. Uh, It has been exposed. And and he has, you know, when I talk to Russia experts, people, not people who analyze Russia from afar, but people who actually know Russia and have lived there, you know, they don't think that Putin has really paid enough of a political price at home that that there is a threat to his, you know, tenure, right, his, or his, his, his tenure, his stability of, of head of state. But clearly the whole world has seen that this is not um, the sophisticated Russian army uh, that, we, that we thought that we were seeing, like in, in Syria, for example, for all of those years, whenever, uh, whenever the Russians were there supporting Assad. Now, uh, Morgan Ortega, do you think the reason he hasn't paid uh, such a high political price is because— there hasn't been such a um, detriment from uh, financial fallout, despite sanctions that we've put in place. Uh, I think their their currency is pretty stable and they've been able to continue to finance their war. Uh, do you think that's part of why people are like, hey, look, he's you know, he's not the nicest guy, but he keeps us afloat. Um, I, sorry, say that one more time about uh, the keeps us afloat. Well, I'm that saying there's. There were many plans in place to destabilize the Russian economy through sanctions and whatnot, and that seems to not have happened. So do you think that that's why he still curries favor with the people? Yes. Uh, well, it's certainly that's part of it. I also think that the psyche, listen, the, the emphasis that we place on human life uh, here in America is just not the same everywhere else in the world. Mm. If you look historically at the Russians, right, they've they have thrown, they will throw uh, lots of able-bodied men at the problem. I think you bring up a really, really good point about the sanctions. Um, and, and not a, and let me tell you, you know, this is stuff that you'll hear on the Morgan Ortega show on Sundays, and, and hopefully yeah. I'm not getting too wonky. But uh, I did work at the Treasury Department as an Intel uh, analyst in, in my, let's see, I was in my 20s whenever, whenever I was doing that. And I learned a lot about the financial flows, learned a lot about sanctions. And so what happened initially after uh, the invasion, whenever the U.S. and Europe joined together to put um, comprehensive sanctions on Russia, it was a Mm -hmm. very good first step. But the problem is, is that they never followed up with the second step. So the administration uh, and even the Europeans like to boast and brag and say, this is what we did, uh, you know, on the sanctions. And I say back to them, I actually won't reveal who it was, but I did just attend a dinner last night. Uh, with European ambassadors, there was about five of them, and, and they were. One of them was sort of saying, "Well, we're very proud about what we did on the sanctions uh, regime with the Biden administration." And I said, "It was a great first step, but you guys never followed up, and now the ruble is trading higher than it was uh, before right. the war, and Russia's economy hasn't paid the price. Not because sanctions are ineffective, but because the because they never followed up and did something that we call um, in the Treasury world secondary sanctions. So here's an example." To go back to the Trump administration, we had a sanctions campaign uh, against Iran that we called the maximum economic pressure campaign. And without going down a rabbit hole on this sanction versus right. that sanction, uh, the bottom line is that we had um, we had much, much, much tougher sanctions on the Iranian regime uh, than the Biden administration has on Russia, even after the invasion. So, uh, for example, you know, Russian uh, Russia can still basically they can get around a, 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 a lot of the sanctions. They are able uh, to do energy exports. Uh, one of the really big ones is that their banks. We never really stopped their banks from being a part of the international um, community. Uh, we didn't really put sanctions on a lot of their metals and mining exports. So I bring all up to say, you know, the first round of sanctions were effective, but then whatever, you know, the Russian behavior did not change. What you should then do in a sanctions regime is say, okay, 
Now we're going to round two. Now it's like the next step. And we did that in the Trump administration against the Islamic Republic of Iran. And it was one of the reasons that I think we were able to really squeeze the Iranians. We were able to uh, constrain them from funding terrorism, from funding Hezbollah, from funding funding Hamas. Uh, Sure, uh, they still did it, but they didn't have as much money as they have now to do it. And you force the regime to make trade-off decisions. You force them to make decisions about are we spending going to spend the uh, lower amount of funds that we have left on uh, munitions, on weapons, on support to terrorism, or are we going to spend it on public health infrastructure or new schools or new roads or or whatever it may be? So I would just, you know, again, um, to get not to get too much in the weeds, although I probably already have, but to challenge the Biden administration, you know, yes, it was a good first round of sanctions, but it was never followed up. And the Russians, I mean, listen, again, smart people, they figured out how to work around it. Makes sense. Morgan Ortegas, stick with us. We're going to come back and uh, talk a little bit about about um, Iran and what they're funding and what's going on with Israel and Hamas. Folks, we're on with Morgan Ortega. She's the host of the Morgan Ortega show that you can uh, catch on the weekends on Sirius XM. Former um, spokesman for the um, State Department during the Trump years. And we're coming right back. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. We have every expectation that uh, that Israel will do exactly what they say they're doing, which is to continue to go after the terrorist leaders and to do so in a way that minimizes civilian harm. As I said in my opening statement, as the president said, that's their intent. Um, and it, it's important that the results match that intent. That's National Security Council spokesman John Kirby at a news conference today. Um, uh, reiterating the support that the United States has for Israel in this war and um, um, hunkering down here that they remain confident that Israel is going to minimize civilian harm while pursuing terrorist leaders. And Morgan Ortega, this seems to be the the number one um, um, talking point in the media, social media, every media. They're saying, you know, X amount of Jews were killed on October 7th and, you know, that number has been multiplied by whatever factor since then. And, you know, how many more innocent Palestinians have to die before um, they're satisfied? Making no, you know, um, no point as to saying they're trying to eradicate Hamas and Hamas is hiding behind hospitals and schools. And it seems like a very circuitous debate that I I don't know that they they or we or anybody eventually wins this uh, debate in public. What say you? Yeah, well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, poor John Kirby there. Uh, he was actually having to clean up uh, because whenever President Biden was with Zelensky is. yesterday, yeah, he was always having to clean up. Uh, Biden um, said something about Israel, and I, I don't remember the exact quote, but it, it, it essentially made an offhand comment about Israel and indiscriminate bombings. Um, and that's not what's happening. Uh, and, and so, again, he was Kirby was Admiral Kirby, who, by the way, I know is a, you know, is a friend of mine. He was State Department spokesperson before me. So he was having to clean up there. It was I'm glad they cleaned it up. Right. Because it would not be good for that to remain on the record that the administration is accusing Israel of indiscriminate bombing. That is not what's happening. Uh, it's obviously incredibly different from, you know, let's say for what the Russians are, are doing, for example. Um, first of all, nobody wants civilians to die in war. Uh, and nobody wants that. Um, unfortunately, Hamas does. And so for every uh, innocent Palestinian uh, child, you know, woman, uh, whoever it is, any, any civilian that, that dies, your heart absolutely breaks for them. And to me, it's, it's just even more frustrating that they are represented by a terrorist group who has zero value for, your, for their life. I mean, thinking about these cowards, these cowards hide behind sick people and hospitals. They hide behind women and children. They want women and children uh, to be killed because then it's, it's, it's more use 
for their propaganda. You know, I have, I've been around uh, a, a lot of people, a lot of warriors, men and women warriors in, in the military. I uh, been, have, have been in the reserves for a long time. And I've been, uh, you know, around a lot of people over the last 20 years and, and what we call GWAT, Global War on Terror, that kind of thing, where, you know, they were involved in, in combat, you know, where people passed away. Uh, obviously, people were killed in combat. That's what happens. And that is, um, I don't know a single guy, and, you know, I've got a lot of friends that served in special forces. I don't know a single guy that would ever purposely hide behind a woman or a child. And that's what these disgusting terrorists who are subhuman named Hamas do. So, you know, if you want to cease fire, that's fine. Uh, tell your warriors to stop hiding behind girls. Yeah, I agree with that. But it seems like the... Um the UN and everybody else out there is just beating this drum to, to stand with the civilians. And again, I, I agree. Everybody should support the civilians, um, but they kind of lose sight of the whole point of what's going on here. Uh, Morgan Ortegas, um, are you able to uh, stick with us so we could talk about your radio show for a couple more minutes, but I have to take a quick pause right here. Yes, sir. You got it. All right, folks, we're coming right back with Morgan Ortegas, former um, spokesperson for the United States Department of State. Uh, in the Trump years, and we'll be right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, folks, welcome back. We're on with uh, Morgan Ortega. She's a former Trump State Department spokesperson, and um, she's also the host of the Morgan Ortega's radio show. That's on Sirius XM Channel 125 on Sundays at 11 in the morning to 1 o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. And uh, Morgan Ortega, let everybody know in about a minute or so uh, how they could follow you, how they could find you, and what they can expect to hear on the Morgan Ortega show. Well, thank you so much for letting me promote it. I, I'm really, really excited uh, to be your colleague and to be on Sirius XM. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, so you can find us. Thank you. I'm, I'm super excited. So you can find us every Sunday, 11 to 1 East um, on Patriot Channel, of course, Sirius 125. And we, our show, let's see, we debuted last week. Uh, we had, we, it was an amazing first show. We had Senator Cruz, Rubio, Graham, Trump National Security Advisor, Robert O'Brien. Uh, this coming Sunday, we're, we're still building the list, but we're definitely going to have my former boss, Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. I believe we're going to have Senator uh, Katie Britt, uh, who is from Alabama. Um, and we'll have a few more. Let's see, it's Wednesday. So we still have a couple more days working out schedules. I believe we're going to have Mike Rogers from Michigan as well. Uh, the congressman. So uh, it, it's going to be a great time. We also have somebody actually that's really interesting, Dr. Miles Yu, uh, who was Pompeo's a senior advisor on China. Uh, uh, Miles is is amazing, so conservative, understands the Communist Party better than anybody because he grew up in it, and wow. he's a total China hawk because of that. It's going to be a fascinating discussion. But What's this the, is what uh, we website? do every Sunday. So you can go to Morgan Ortegas, and my last name's a little funny, so I'll spell it for everybody, O-R-T-A-G-U-S, MorganOrtegas.com. And you can find me on X, on Instagram, and on Facebook, at Morgan Ortegas. You got it. Well, Morgan Ortegas, you are a gentlewoman, a scholar, and a patriot. Godspeed to you. Good luck with the radio show, and thanks for being here. Thank you so much. You bet. All right, folks, we're coming right back uh, with the rest of our program for tonight. Your calls and more are coming up as well. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. Don't move a muscle. We're just getting started. The city that never sleeps. 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City. It's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. 
And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to hour number two of the program. Thanks for tuning in. Our phone number, if you want to join us on our late-night national town hall conversation, feel free to give us a call, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. And I was watching the news, and I'm still watching it. There's a, a video right behind me of Hunter Biden doing a press conference outside Capitol Hill. And, you know, with the volume off, because I'm speaking with you all across America, it, you would think that he was either already a congressman <laughs> or somebody was launching a political campaign, right? He doesn't look like he's uh, about to be the defendant in a, in a big case uh, that has to do with him, you know, bundling money for his dad and, and by way of bribery and whatnot. And at least that's what's being alleged. So uh, just fascinating to see if um, if if he... In, in turn runs for office and uh, uses this notoriety or or infamy to, to move forward in that direction. So I just wanted to make that quick note and also just update you on a couple of things. So the uh, judge in the January 6th case against President Trump has uh, put a stay on things, saying everything is pending uh, resolution on presidential immunity, saying that because Trump was president at the time of January 6th, you can't prosecute the guy for, for doing whatever he did because he wasn't in the Capitol. Um, so this is what's going before the Supreme Court at the request of uh, Biden's special counsel, Jack Smith. So we'll see how that uh, pans out. Also, the Federal Reserve is holding rates steady. This one, I think, was a no-brainer. Nobody wants to raise rates in December uh, going into into Christmas and Hanukkah and everything like that. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, Speaker Johnson in, uh, on the House of Representatives side, he says that he's confident that the House will greenlight a an impeachment inquiry into Joe Biden, who I like to call Joe El Baboso Biden. And, of course, his um, his trustee sidekick, que mala eres, the vice president. So we'll see what happens with them. But there's other news, right? There's a piece, uh, KTLA, Channel 5, um, in L.A., they've they've got this piece that says California is the most expensive state in the United States to get a divorce. Then you've got um, other there's other pieces on this. I, I saw this as this big news today. Uh, let me see. Where did I put it? Right here. It's in the hill, the hill dot com. Again, also this piece on uh, the cheapest and most expensive states to get a divorce. The average cost of a divorce in the United States is seven thousand five hundred and sixty seven dollars. Now, I can tell you that I think mine cost me more than that back in 2011, 2012, whenever it was finalized. Uh, it took about a year to get it done. <clears throat> and it's probably one of the uh, easier ones from others that I've shared with. Uh, but interesting with this whole thing is uh, in order to find the most and least expensive states to get a divorce in 2023, uh, Forbes magazine considered the cost of divorce filing fees, the average cost of a lawyer, the cost of living, and the percentage of household income it takes to pay for a divorce across the country. California ranked as the most expensive place in the United States to dissolve a marriage at an average cost of 10159 bucks. Other states with high costs of living around the uh, top 10, uh, rounded out the top 10, while the least expensive states are in the nation's breadbasket in the South. So, okay, there you go. It's cheaper to get divorced in the South. Um, and there's like a list here. Uh, this is funny. Look at this. Um, two most expensive states, California and New York. Oregon's number three. Massachusetts, number four. Alaska's number five. And, uh, and, and we'll go into the list a little bit more a little bit later. But I, I just thought that was very, very interesting. And I want to talk about this because, of course, you know, I'm a, a pseudo expert on divorce because I was divorced and, you know, I have my own opinions and whatnot. But there's actually people out there that host a divorce program. Yep, it's true. It's true. I was at a party last night for Metropolitan Magazine and um, my good friend Zen Sams, she's a broadcaster uh, out of New York as well. We worked together for a little while in New York City and I saw her. She's on the cover of this magazine being honored for being a fantastic radio host and all the great work that she does. And somebody that I met at the event is named T.H. Irwin. 
And uh, she was really cool. And we were talking about uh, a show that she hosts. It's a podcast called the uh, it's called Divorce Etc. The Divorce Etc. Podcast. And she has an organization called X Experts, which I thought was very, very clever. And of course, with National Divorce Day coming up in just a couple of weeks, uh, I thought, why not talk about this now? So, folks, help me welcome T.H. Irwin to the program. T.H., welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here with you, Rich. Oh, likewise. Now, what's your initial reaction to this story that's um, being um, published today that California is the most expensive place to get divorced? Do you think that, uh, that's conventional wisdom? Did it shock you? Did it surprise you? Was it no sweat off your brow? Well, you said that the average price for a divorce is $7,000 mm -hmm. and California was the most expensive. I mean, I don't live in California. I know there are a lot of very uh, unique laws and rules around divorce in California. So I don't know much about California, but I live in New Jersey and I'm familiar with New York and New Jersey. And I would have loved a $7,000 divorce. <laughs> I bet that you is would've. not expensive. And that is not the average as far as the people that I know um, around here in the tri-state area who find themselves needing a divorce. Yeah, Well, the so, number that they come up with in, uh, by Forbes magazine was $9,206.36 for New York specifically, saying that the uh, uh, the cost for a lawyer, and this is, of course, very skewed. I, I don't know where you can hire a lawyer for $83.12, but that was the uh, average lawyer wage, and the filing fee was about $335. So um, I, I agree that the number seems skewed and is likely going to be higher. Uh, but did, did it surprise you that California beat New York? Yes. It did. And I wonder, you know, what parts of California it's more, you know, prevalent in, you know, what are they basing it off of, you know, a remote part of California is really skewing L.A. and San Francisco divorces. I Could mean, be. I don't really understand. I, I, I'm not sure about those numbers. I'm questioning well, Forbes. <laughs> one of our listeners from uh, across the country has a, a question for you. Her name is Sue. She's in Schwenksville, Pennsylvania on WXDE. And uh, she wanted to share a little bit about her divorce. Sue, welcome. You're on with T.H. Irwin and me. Go right ahead. Hi there. Well, when you said 10000 that seems cheap to me because here in Pennsylvania, it took mm -hmm. me seven years to get my divorce. And I stopped counting at $50,000. Yeah. And it, this all depends on whether or not you have a, a person who's cooperative or not. Because in this state, when you first file, if the other person doesn't agree to anything, you have to wait two years so you can move forward. And they can fool around and fool around and delay you and show up to court unprepared and drag it out as long as that. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Again, wow. it was the best money I ever spent. But, you know what I'm saying, glad it's in the rearview mirror. Well, thank yeah, you, I Sue. Hear I you. appreciate that. TH, do you think that's pretty common? Well, I know that there are states that make you wait. So you file and then they make you wait before you're granted a divorce because they want you to try to resolve it on your own. And then they put a penalty on you if you don't resolve your divorce within a certain period of time afterwards. So there is a strict time frame, which I don't mind. But yeah, I agree with her. That's very inexpensive. My divorce took four years. I divorced wow. a very difficult man and dragged through the courts and all of the things. And that could have been, you know, one week's worth of me with my lawyer. So it really comes down to who you hire for your lawyer, what kind of a divorce you're moving forward with. I mean, a lot of people can't afford a lawyer, so that cuts off a lot of the money that you would be paying towards your divorce, right? If you're both representing yourself. Also, if you're young and you don't really have any assets and you don't have anything to fight over, then that also simplifies your, you know, your, your expenses and the whole divorce process. So the simpler the process is, the more amicable it is, the less expensive it will be. Folks, we're on with T.H. Irwin. She is the host of Divorce Etc. 
That's a podcast you need to be subscribed to and check out, as well as uh, the founder of xexperts.com, xexperts, uh, which is an incredibly clever name, by the way. And we're going to continue straight ahead uh, with uh, seven simple steps to divorce proof your Christmas. So, uh, TH, stick with us. We're coming right back. Your calls and more are coming up straight ahead. 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. that listen and they love your show and I appreciate it very much. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, familia, welcome back, amigos. Rich Valdez here with you, your liberty-loving Latino amigo. And I'm here with you till 1 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, But right now we're talking about this piece that's in uh, the sun, the sun.com. And listen to this uh, headline here. Seven simple steps to divorce proof your Christmas, including the code word you need to use with your other half. So now there's safe words just for Christmas holidays. Anyway, I want to bring back our guest. Uh, T.H. Irwin is the uh, founder of xexperts.com and the host of Divorce Etc. the podcast. And if you're not uh, already subscribed to that, you should be um, if you're interested in listening about divorce or you know, even if you're not getting a divorce, you just want to hear about divorces. Uh, I think it's always a fascinating topic. And let's uh, continue here. Let's continue with uh, TH. What are your, What is your uh, reaction to this piece in the sun about these seven simple steps to divorce proof your Christmas holiday? So it, it all contradicts itself. There's nothing simple about divorce. <laughs> there are no mm-hmm. quick tips about divorce. Divorce is huge life altering event, as I know you've experienced yourself as I have as well. Sure. So there, there are a lot of things to think about. Um, I think that it's important that you have guidance. I think the number one thing in all of this, if you're feeling uncomfortable and you're feeling that your marriage may be coming to an end is that you trust your gut. For me, that was the number one thing that I missed. And I should have done probably sooner, but trust your gut. If it doesn't feel right, it's not right. It's a very hard decision to come to, especially with kids, especially with someone who you've identified with for most of your life, right? Like if you're this couple for 20 plus years, who are you after that? So there's a lot of emotional stuff to unravel, but I don't believe that there's anything simple about planning for a divorce, but I do have broad stroke, you know, guidelines that, of things that you should think about if this is, if this is where you think you're heading. And what's some of the advice you give? First thing is to find yourself a really good therapist. Men and women should do this. Women tend to do it more than men. Women seek out community, seek out support generally more than men do, but it's really important to have someone to go and talk to Um, your friends are your friends, but they have an agenda and they have judgment. Your family definitely has judgment. Um, your friend groups are going to change. So to have somebody with an objective point of view uh, in your life is really important at this huge stage in your life. If, if God forbid you got sick or something major happened in your life that wasn't divorced, you would seek out support. Divorce is no different and it's nothing to be ashamed of. So that now would let be me my ask you, first TH, tip. Do you do you mm-hmm. ever tell people, don't do it? It's it's too much money. Try to work it out. 
So we don't ever encourage divorce. There is a process called discernment therapy. And if you and your spouse are able to talk through um, what's happening right now between all of you, you know, between the two of you and you come to an agreement that it's working or not working, then I definitely recommend discernment therapy because you don't want to be resentful that you were forced into this or forced to stay. You know, 50% of marriages end in divorce, but another 20% stay in their marriages because of financial abuse, emotional abuse, you know, the fear of getting out. So yes, it could cost a lot of money, but it will make you sick if you stay in a relationship that's really damaging to you. So I think that if you can talk about it, great. And if you can't sit down with your spouse in a straight conversation, is this working? Then I think you probably already know the answer. And let everybody know how they, um, how do they find you? How do they listen to your podcast? How do they um, you know, um, and what can they expect to hear when they tune in? So Divorce Etc. is wrapping up season three. We are on every podcast platform. Um, you can look it up as Divorce ETC, and mm-hmm. it's hosted by the ex-experts. That's me and the co-founder, Jessica. She's my best friend. This was created because we're best friends growing up, getting married, having kids, and 13 years into our marriages, we realized... Well, we found out that our husbands were not being faithful to us. So we created this because there were no resources out there to help us. So Divorce Etc. is a, we have over 200 episodes. An ex-expert is a professional who helps you at any stage, even beyond. And Jessica and I are your girlfriends through it all. Because not every question is meant for your lawyer, your financial planner. And once your team and your divorce is final then you re- the work really starts. So we are here to support you all the way through. So Divorce Etc. on all social media at E-X-E-X-P-E-R-T-S and at our website. Outstanding. T.H. Irwin, I want to thank you for being with us. Uh, I appreciate the conversation and the insight. Godspeed to you and have a great holiday. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great night. You bet. And I want to quickly go to the phones. We only have like a minute or so to go, but let's go to Jennifer in McKenzie, Tennessee on WCMT. Jennifer, what's on your mind? Yeah, I love you, Shell. Great. Usually you put me to sleep, but tonight. That's my job. I was married to both my husbands for 25 years each in Illinois. The first one divorce was like over $6,000 each. And we're talking probably over 12 years ago. And, uh, yeah, it had to be longer than that. And then my second one, I did it myself. And it ah, was about so you saved some money. $50 total. Yo, you betcha. But Look at that. a lot of begging, a lot of planning, a lot of rehearsal, a lot of, I'll give you this, <laughs> you know, you take that. And it was, it's not easy, but it was a wow. lot, yeah, a lot cheaper. Let me tell you, Jennifer, thanks for your call, by the way. I appreciate it. And B, um, big shout out to everybody in Tennessee. Uh, I, I hated getting divorced the first time. There's no way I'm doing it a second time. That's for sure. All right, folks, stick around. We're coming back uh, with more on America at Night with me, Rich Valdez, and your calls and uh, lots more conversation. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. All right, America, welcome back. And, you know, what's interesting in, in the battle for the culture and the soul of America, what, what once was, and we, we have people that are just taking over. And they know exactly how to take over. They know that you got to get inside the media. You got to get inside the classroom. You got to get inside the college campus. You've got to get inside the, the halls of Congress. And you've got to get inside the school board at the most local level so you can, can – continue to control things and have the votes that count. And 
it's it's sad and sinister at the same time. Sad that people that want to bring about fundamental change, and I can't hate them for wanting to bring about change because we should all want to bring about change, right? We want to make things better. And what, what what's sad is that we're, the conservatives, patriots, we're not, in my opinion, fighting as hard as we could. And we have people that are winning and taking over. Stacey Robostelli. You know, a couple of months ago, and I'll play this every day if I have to, but there's a woman who runs an organization. Her name is Stacy Robostelli. She's the director of education for an organization called High Tops. And High Tops is dedicated to promoting queer theory and gender ideology in public schools across the country. And in a moment, you're going to hear her say that their, their sweet spot for promoting these um, ideas in public school classrooms are fifth through eighth grade. However, you'll also hear her say that they're really putting a focus on kindergarten through second grade because they want to make sure they get these kids before puberty as what she calls early intervention. Listen to this. The most critical time to be there is grades five through eight because you want to catch kids when they're starting puberty because that's the time in which identity formation is central to their lives. However, early intervention is key. So we actually are designing a kindergarten through grade two curriculum this summer. And I will tell you, one of the most rewarding experiences, Nikki, uh, we were in a local school system in an elementary school and uh, we were in grades three, four, and five. And after we were there, um, five students went to the principal's office and came out. So we are really intentionally going into younger and younger grades. So there she is, Stacy Robostelli. Now, she's out there doing what she's got to do for her nonprofit. I don't like what they do a little bit. I don't like it at all. But we've got our own people that are out there doing things, right? We've got people that put America first, that put children first, that put faith and family first. And one of those is Sherry Few. She's the co-founder and president of USPIE, Parents Involved in Education. And their website, again, is USPIE.org. We've had her on before to talk about the documentary they produced. Today, we're going to have her on to talk about a a new school board president that was just sworn into office. And instead of a Quran or a Bible or anything else you could think of, they decided to take their oath of office by putting their hand upon sexually explicit books. And I, I think that's despicable. Sherry Few, welcome back. Hi, I appreciate you having me back, Rich. Oh, you bet. You bet. So what are your thoughts? Uh, you heard some audio uh, from this woman, Stacy Robostelli, who is um, just one of many people that are out there trying to infiltrate the culture, change the culture uh, to get at our children. And and now we see this, this woman taking her oath of office as a proverbial uh, F you in the face, I believe, uh, to parents saying, you know, who cares what you're teaching your kids? Who cares what you think? We're, we're still going to do what we want to do with these books. What's your reaction? Well, I agree with you, first of all, that it's absolutely despicable uh, and, and evil. I mean, to think that you would replace the Bible or, as you said, even the Quran or something, some other faith um, volume with pornography and explicit materials and obscenity it it is it's just pure evil i can't imagine anybody who would think that that was um a positive way to enter their newly elected position and and as you said sort of thumbing her nose at at the parents who object to this and you know obviously they have partisan elections in pennsylvania because they identify her as a democrat who was re-elected to her board and then elected president in the ceremony where she swore on on this stack of pornography. And so while she's a Democrat, and I think you and I would agree that Democrats are kind of pushing this agenda, but I think when it comes to parents and especially parents that aren't, you know, necessarily 
politically active or involved or informed, I think many parents object to this, and I don't think it is purely a partisan issue. Sherry Few, when when we hear this, I agree it's not a partisan issue. This is about children, about protecting children and the innocence of children and really giving parents the um, – re- affirming the parents the, the power that they should have. And I feel like it little by little is being usurped away from the parents, and some parents are all on board to give it away. How do you um, – how do you advise people that are listening right now that are saying, well, what's going on? How did we get here? Um, I think too many people are worried about how we got here and too few of us are trying to figure out how we get out of here. Well, I think both points are important, you know, understanding how we got here so that we can begin to, you know, unravel the things that have been um, stitched together to bring us to the point where we are. You know, there were one of the things that's very Um, difficult to overcome with these pornographic books in schools is the fact that back in the 1960s, many states adopted um, obscenity exemptions, exemption statutes, meaning that the obscenity laws in their states would not apply to certain institutions and schools and libraries were those two of those institutions. So, you know, since there's been so much talk about it in the last few years, there are some states that are trying to um, outlaw, uh, you know, the the idea that um, educators and librarians can't be prosecuted for obscenity. In fact, two laws, two states have been successful, Arkansas and Indiana, and mm-hmm. two states passed bills, but they were vetoed. So we see we have seen some action, you know, in the in the right direction, positive. But but this is the problem. These books are clearly obscene. And, and they clearly violate pornography and obscenity laws. If I was an adult and I gave these books to children anywhere outside of a library or a school, I could be prosecuted. But schools are exempt from these because of these laws that were adopted back in the 60s. So these laws need to be overturned. And like I said, there is some action toward that. Um, but in the meantime, parents need to remain vigilant. And we've seen, you know, a lot of parents speaking out. And, and, you know, what's so ironic about this whole thing is that the parents that are speaking out, and I know you've seen these videos, they're taking these books to the, to the school board meetings and in the public comments period, right. they're reading from the graphic section and then their mics are cut off. So it's okay for adults, but, but not okay for children. I mean, excuse me, the other way around. It's not okay to read in public to adults, but it's okay for children. So the irony of that is just uh, over the top. And and so there are there are organizations like ours and there's there's several others as I've been doing research on this topic um, that are really they're focused specifically on this. One of them is the Child and Parental Rights Campaign. And in the documentary that we talked about in our last um, interview, uh, one of the attorneys from that organization was, you know, was featured in our film. And what they what they're saying is that. The exemptions are allowing school staff to expose children to material that would otherwise be criminal. Unbelievable. And, and folks, I just want to remind you, we're talking about Karen Smith. She's a Democrat in Pennsylvania that was sworn in as a new school board president. And uh, shockingly, instead of placing her hand on a Bible, Karen placed her hand on a set of controversial books, the type of books that are sexually explicit. One of the books was Flamer a graphic novel that includes characters discussing pornography, erections, masturbation, penis size, and an illustration that depicts naked naked teenage boys. Now listen, if you want to be into this stuff, be into that stuff. I don't recommend it, but if that's your thing, it's your thing. But you don't do it in a public school, right? You don't do it when you're taking your oath of office as, as the uh, president of a school board. I think that's absolutely crazy. And we're going to continue our discussion on that and uh, the overall attack of wokeness and learning more about what Sherry Few is doing out there in uh, in the culture on the front lines to fight back. So, uh, folks, the phone number, 833-482-5337. If you want to join our conversation, 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833 833- for Valdez. That's 833-482-5337. 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. This 
is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. America, sometimes I just like to hear the horns play, right? Because we like to give a little ode to the old school uh, flavor of the music uh, in old school talk radio. And uh, anyway, uh, a quick interlude from there. I wanted to, um, again, reiterate a little bit of what we were talking about before with um, something Sherry Few brought up, our guest Sherry Few from USPIE, was that there, there were a number of parents that stepped up to the plate uh, all over the country attending school board meetings. Uh, in fact, we saw them turn an election from um, the Democrats to Republicans on this school board issue after uh, Terry McAuliffe made some really kind of crazy comments saying that, you know, it's not the parents that decide, it's the schools that should decide or whatever it was he said. But he basically let the cat out of the bag. And there was um, a number of these. And over the weekend, I was in um, Palm Beach and I attended the Turning Point um, I guess they call it their winter gala. And one of the guests that was uh, at the Turning Point USA meeting at, at uh, Mar-a-Lago was uh, Pastor John Amachukwu. And he was uh, a dad. He went as a dad, not as a pastor. I think he went as a dad to his school board meeting. And anything yet on that audio? And the pastor started um, explaining things about the school's gender policy, uh, about all sorts of things, and just really taking exception, um, saying that, you know, the policies that they, uh, the school, were uh, promoting were addressing the rights and needs of students with diverse gender identities and expressions. Uh, But he then made reference to things that are in the material, like in in the books that the kids are reading, Uh, things like anal sex, oral sex, orgasms. And that eventually prompted the school board's president, Evelyn Garcia Morales, to tell him to stop, to stop quoting from exactly what they were allowing kids to read. And she went on saying, no, stop. Uh, absolutely not, she said, having to cut off Mr. Amanchuku's microphone. I'm stopping your time because I'm going to correct you. She continued, tell him to stop and not to use profanity. Now, in, in a video on Instagram shared by Moms for Liberty, um, they were talking about excerpts from the very book, Flamer, that these people... Um, or this individual that we're discussing with Sherry Few, Karen Smith, the new school board president in Pennsylvania, she, that's one of the books that she took her oath on. So Sherry Few, um, do you think if more and more parents continue to step up to the plate and, and push back this way, it's going to have an impact? Or do you feel like they're just so brazen? They just don't care. Well, I think parents cannot give up, and we have to remain vigilant. We have to continue to speak out. We have to continue to protect children from these very harmful um, literature. And uh, literature is is a stretch, obviously, this pornography. So, you know, I I think that um, they will, though, kind of um, ignore or, or continue to fight us. There's actually a lot of money behind the other side. And the money that's being pushed or used to push these books into schools is alarming. So I, I was uh, presenting at a conference about a month ago, and I, one of the other presenters 
did a presentation on the pornography and the content of these books. And so the one book that you mentioned uh, that was in the stack that she, that Karen Smith laid her hand on in order to um, be right. sworn in was, was Flamer. But two of the other books I'm, I'm familiar with and were in the presentation that I saw, The Bluest Eye, which I've been familiar with for some time because it was in the recommended reading list for the Common Core Standards, which was a battle we had in 2010. Oh, yeah. So that's been around for a while. It's actually an award-winning book and, and considered a classic. Um, but that book had graphic dis- descriptions of sexual abuse, and, and the, the child who was being sexually abused talked about how it brought her pleasure. Now, how sickening is that to think mm. that you're going to give this book to a child that's being sexually, you know, uh, that depicts a child being sexually abused, and then they find it pleasurable. I mean, when I, after I saw this presentation, right. I felt like I needed to go take a bath. It was so disgusting. The content, the pictures, the profanity, the profanity in these books are, are huge. You're right, Sherry Few. And I want you to stick with me. We're going to take a quick pause right here and then come back and let everybody know how they could learn more about what's going on at USPIE. Folks, don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. And, of course, we're taking your calls on all of the topics today, whether it's uh, the the shenanigans coming out of Washington, D.C., what we're seeing coming out of these school boards, uh, the the, uh, interesting report that we got on divorce, and so much more that's happening this evening. Uh, Again, the phone number for Open Phone America, if you want to get your calls in for that, you can, 833-482-5337. 8334-VALDEZ. Again, Open Phone America, minutes away at the top of the next hour. And I wanted to wrap up with Sherry Few. Sherry Few, let everybody know how they can support the work that you're doing at USPIE. Well, they can visit our website, which is USPIE. That's USPI.org. They can join the movement there or see if there's a chapter in their state. And the other thing they can do is go to our film's website, Truth and Lies in American Education, the film's website is truthandliesfilm.us. This is a great film that they can share with friends and family so that they can become well-educated on the, atroc- you know, the atrocities that are happening in the government-funded schools today. Sherry Few, I want to thank you for bringing us up to speed on what's going on. Keep up the great work that you're doing at USPIE and with the films that you're putting out there. Uh, Folks, I recommend you follow uh, Sherry Few on whatever social media that you're on and check out the website, USPIE Parents Involved in Education uh, dot, um, let me see, is that dot org or dot com? Dot org. There we go. Thank you, Sherry Few. You are a gentlewoman, a scholar, and a patriot. Folks, Open Phone America is coming up right now. 833-4-VALDEZ. 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't go anywhere. I'm Rich Valdez. From the city that never sleeps, 17 miles from Madison Square Garden, New York City, it's America at Night with Rich Valdez, America's favorite late night talk program featuring interesting guests from around the world and calls from across America. And now, here is your host, Rich Valdez. Hi there, good evening, and what's up, America? I am Rich Valdez, Valdez with an S, at Rich Valdez on all of the social media. Welcome to the third hour of the program, the hour we like to call Open Phone America. This is where we take calls from uh, you all, the listeners, all across the country. Uh, I see we've got calls from South Dakota, Wisconsin, New Jersey, and more coming in right now. And um, the number for that, 833-482-5337. 
833-4-VALDEZ is the phone number. And uh, there's a number of things that I want to get to today uh, in this third hour, in addition to your calls. Um, a bunch of interesting stories that are out there. Uh, you get this hiker that survived a thousand foot fall and being stranded for three days on the side of a mountain in Hawaii and lived. I mean, I think that's remarkable. Um, absolutely um, remarkable. Then you've got uh, a U.S. comedian that was murdered in Colombia after trying to we- meet some women that he met online. You got to be careful out there, guys. Uh, we'll get into that one as well. And uh, they found a body in a warehouse in Philadelphia that was identified as an escaped inmate. So I guess it didn't go well for him after the prison break. So we'll um, talk about that. And seven fourth graders in Virginia are now sick. Thank God they're not dead after eating gummy bears that were contaminated with fentanyl. Uh, I don't know if you remember a couple of uh, months back, like four or five there were some kids that gotten sick uh, and one of them died at a daycare in the Bronx. And it turned out the woman who was running the daycare, her husband was uh, a drug dealer and they had fentanyl in, in, in the daycare facility. I mean, that's the kind of crazy that's going on. Uh, so I want to get to this quick story here though, because uh, I thought those were all pretty interesting. And um, this guy fell a thousand feet. I'm looking at a picture of him. He's got a sling on his left arm and a cane in his right hand. You'd think after falling a thousand feet, you'd be in way worse shape. Well, with his um, left arm broken, his right eye is swollen shut. 34-year-old Ian Snyder says he can't believe he survived a thousand-foot tumble from a hiking trail in Hawaii. And uh, he was stranded for three days next to a stream saying he was making his peace with God. The California father of three. Uh, spoke about this harrowing ordeal uh, yesterday and was able to meet and thank in person the rescuers and the members of the local hiking community who banded together to find him um, last Thursday near a waterfall in the uh, Ko'olau mountain range on the side of Oahu. And he says, quote, it's a miracle. First and foremost, I'm glad to be here, incredibly glad to be here and glad to be Mostly in one piece, Snyder said at the uh, news conference in Hawaii uh, yesterday. Snyder said that he was hiking alone early last week on what he described as a treacherous stretch of the Ko'olau Summit Trail when he was, you know, out there and his adventure took an unexpected twist. This is according to ABC News. Poor guy. Look at it, this guy. He's, he's banged up, but honestly, not as banged up as I would have expected him to be. Uh, I think he's right when he says it's a miracle. I mean, a thousand feet? I mean, I've seen people fall a lot less and sustain pretty serious injuries. So anyway, kudos to him. Thank God, right? Thank God for being God in a situation like that one because that, that's a tough one. And uh, these other stories I'm going to get to, we're going to get to those periodically. Uh, I also want to get to some of your phone calls before it's time to uh, to hit the break. Um, let's go to Ann. Ann is in La Crosse, Wisconsin on WIZM. Uh, Ann, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Well, thank you for taking my call, and you're looking great tonight. Well, you're, thank you. You're just a hunk of, you're just a hunk of, hunk of burning love. <laughs> and and uh, you were talking about divorce, and so I was talking to my neighbor, lady, friend, yeah. mm-hmm. and she said that she's going through a divorce because her husband is always bringing his work home. And I says, well, what is his work? And she said, well, he's a gynecologist. <laughs> that actually made me laugh. That was very funny. Anne, are you like a, a comedy writer? Are you doing stand-up on the side on the weekends? Well, uh, <laughs> I I just like a good joke. Some of these I come up with myself. <laughs> well, really good stuff. Now, let me ask you. Have you ever been uh, mountain climbing in Hawaii? No. I Well, maybe um, with my finger on a map, but other yeah. than that, no. No or hiking for you. Something. 
Yeah, I, I don't recommend it. I think uh, you can get yourself into some pretty big trouble. Um, what, what do you think about this guy that falls 1,000 feet and he looks like he's got a black eye and one broken arm? When he fell that far? <laughs> um, that, I'm thinking the guy should go play the lotto, I right? Have, yeah, really. I, I have a couple of questions, though, uh, because I, I had heard some things and I right. wanted to know if you, you had also heard that. Uh, had you heard, now, I had heard this, maybe maybe you can corroborate this. Um, I had heard that Hamas was founded and funded by Israel. Had you heard that? No, I have not heard that. I, I think somebody mentioned it one day, saying that um, Israel did this to um, to mitigate some, some circumstances they had way back when. But I think the um, upon the research that we did, we found that, it was um, it, it went back to Islamic Jihad and uh, Hezbollah and uh, a, a spinoff of the group that that bombed the um, the uh, the troop barracks in um, Beirut. So that's as far as I, I know about that. I don't know that it was created. But but again, this is part of the problem with these uh, armed conflicts in, in Russia, with Ukraine and, and here as well. I mean, every day I scroll through Instagram and I'm watching videos each day and people's opinions are being swayed one way or the other because of the information that they're consuming. And of course, Instagram, I'm sure, already knows who these people are and feeds them a little extra on one side or a little less on the other uh, to make sure that your your opinions stay consistent. And I've seen videos of that claim to be Israeli IDF soldiers um, going and and mistreating children and in a malicious way. But I mean, it's so over the top that to me, it looks totally rehearsed and totally fake. And there, there's no um, fighting. It's just there. They push them off a bike or, you know, they, they grab a kid. And, and again, these, these kids are, you know, probably 20, right? <laughs> they're, they're really big kids. They're not little kids. And I'm not saying they should hit them. I'm saying I think the whole thing is a fake phony fraud. I think that these guys are, are Palestinians dressed in IDF garb trying to say, look what they're trying to do to us here. Look, we've got video. And they could put it out there. A uh, very common tactic of the Iranians and the Russians. So I wouldn't put it past them in any way to try to, to do that. But ultimately, I think that's what we have here is we have an information war and the propaganda is flowing on both sides really, really well. And uh, I don't know that people really are making much sense of it other than kind of doing what, what they normally do and just checking in with the news and going, oh, okay, they're, they're killing more people. What a shame. And they're going to become desensitized to it because it just keeps happening, sadly. And thank you for your call from La Crosse, Wisconsin, W-I-Z-M. Uh, folks, we get to the rest of your calls and more straight ahead. 833-482-5337, 833-482-5337. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now, 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. is night. This is Rich Valdez. Call now. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's 833-482-5337. 833-4-VALDEZ. That's Valdez with an S. Wow. So I'm, I'm just looking at this story here. This uh, United States uh, comedian and activist was abducted and killed after trying to meet uh, a woman that he found on social media in Colombia. This was reported by a newspaper in Colombia called El Colombiano. And uh, this comedian, his name was Tu Jer Xiong, 50 years old, Asian American, living in Minnesota, was on vacation in uh, the South American country when his heartbreaking demise occurred. This is according to the New York Post. 
uh, Zhang arrived in Medellin on November 29th. You know, it's funny. I was thinking of going to Medellin in December, which is now this December, like toward the end of the year. I hear it's fantastic. Um, this guy's, you know, getting kidnapped and whatnot. Uh, his plan was to spend the holiday season with his family before he came into contact with this woman who he met on social media. And he planned to meet the mystery woman on December 10th, but was attacked and kidnapped by a group of men. Around 7 p.m. local time, the comedian had called a friend of his in Colombia saying the men demanded $2,000 in cash or 8 million Colombian pesos for his release. And uh, Xiong also told his friend who filed the police report that he was being held at gunpoint. Uh, hours earlier, the police were at uh, Mr. Xiong's apartment and they found um, a woman was taking items from the residence, but she ran off before police could arrest her. It's like out of a movie. Xiong's body was found lying in a ravine with over a dozen stab wounds and multiple bruises caused by an apparent fall from over 60 feet. Local law enforcement confirmed the suspects murdered Xiong uh, before a payment was made and an investigation was opened to determine if Xiong's death was caused uh, because he tried to escape. One of the uh, suspected captors has already been apprehended, according to Mr. Xiong's brother. They found some clothes, blood, you know, in the bag, and they were able to confiscate that and apprehend one of the suspects. Wow. What a horrible story for this guy. Absolutely horrible, horrible story. And um, he says that uh, the brother, his name is Eh, E-H, uh, that he hasn't really grasped the fact that his brother has, has died. He says, it's kind of funny how I don't even feel like he's really gone yet. That's uh, denial. I feel like at any moment now he could be knocking at the door. Siung uh, linked his ancestry to the Hmong people, an indigenous group from East and Southeast Asia, and was the valedictorian at Humboldt High School. Wow. What a, it's a sad story. Yeah, he was born in Laos back in 1973. His father worked with the CIA before fleeing to a refugee camp in Thailand to escape the um, communist takeover in Laos back in 1975. So there you have it. That's the story about this poor guy who was telling jokes and went to go find some shorty. And he got uh, got kidnapped and, and killed. Absolutely uh, atrocious. Anyway, let's go to Jeff Lansing, Michigan. Jeff, you're on with Rich Valdez. Go right ahead. W I L. Hi, Rich. Nice. Hi, Rich. Nice Valdez with an S, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, you got it, brother. How are you? What, what do you think yeah, about you know, this comedian getting killed uh, in Colombia? Have you ever gone to Colombia? And if so, did you see any of this going on? No, but I agree with you that Matarain at uh, at this time of year it's it, it's lovely, especially this time of year. Um, I, I thought I was going to tell you a, a, a kind of humorous divorce story, but sure, I don't know how to top that last one right there. That was a biggie. Yeah. Well, what's on so, your mind, Jeff? So anyway, so anyway, uh, 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 talking about divorces, I think they're all pre-programmed. And, and I think they're actually uh, done not so much by attorneys as comedians, because I think they all uh, get together at a bar or a restaurant and, and laugh about who they uh, just took the most money from or whatever. I actually went to a divorce. This is a true story. I was married to the girl for eight months, eight months. Found out uh, 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 that, that she had taken all of my money out of my bank account, which fortunately was you know, eight or ten thousand dollars, whatever. We went to <laughs> we go to the divorce court and and she's obviously pregnant and I'm married to another guy and the judge is looking at me and I'm just shrugging my shoulders and I'm thinking, this is this is golden comedy material right here it's yeah, and this is this happened to you you were you were married to a girl that was married to another guy and was pregnant yes <laughs> wow yeah how did that end up so i, I i'm not gonna go uh look for shorties like that other comedian uh but 
I'm just I'm just saying uh, these things happen, and sometimes I think the attorneys just think it's hilarious to go through this stuff. Yeah, I don't I don't doubt that. But how did your situation work out? Uh, what what happened with your divorce? Did she have to get divorced from everybody? Did she stay married to the other guy? How did that work out? Well, the, the judge first said that that, that her other marriage uh, had to be annulled, and, and 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 now he was in that court that day, and that's a funny thing. And I've I've, I've always wondered: should I try to get a hold of this guy and tell him because he may not know this girl is a compulsive liar. He may not know that he's not really married to her. So it, it's I, some people think it's sad. I don't think it's sad at all. I think it's freaking hilarious. Wow. That's some crazy stuff. So she wasn't married to him. She thought he thought he was married or she told him that, that they were married or the, the judge said you, you are or you're not married. No, they were actually married, but he didn't know that. Uh, uh, her, her guy she's married to now he didn't know that she was married to you <laughs> I know you want to write the script or what <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy that's crazy so ultimately did you get to get divorced or uh, they have nulled their marriage and you got the divorce or um, how did it uh, wind up it, it, it was it was the quickest divorce um, I think in 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 Michigan history. Uh, walked out of the courtroom, went to a room, signed the divorce papers, and all it cost me. She didn't get anything from me. I didn't ask anything from her. Uh, 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 all it cost me was about eighty dollars for a half a day off work. Look at that. Who's luckier than you, Jeff? You made it out with for 80 bucks. I think that's a pretty good deal. Folks, uh, Jeff, thank you for the call. Lansing, Michigan, W-I-L-S. Everybody else that's uh, plugged in, we're going to get to the rest of your calls uh, momentarily when we return. The phone number, 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we've got calls from San Francisco, from New Jersey, from Arkansas, from South Dakota, and more, lots of uh, lots of interesting things that you guys want to say. Happy to entertain those calls and more. 833-482-5337, 833-4-VALDEZ. Don't move a muscle. I'm Rich Valdez. America to the liberty loving Latino Rich Valdez. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Call now 833 4 Valdez. That's 833 482 5337. 833 4 Valdez. That's Valdez with an S. The yeas are 221 and the nays are 212. The resolution is adopted. Today's unanimous vote uh, by our conference showed that we are united as a conference. Uh, we expect to have uh, people honor our subpoenas. Uh, we want to wrap this investigation up. Representative James Comer, uh, he was uh, in a news conference saying that the uh, Republican members all voted in favor of the resolution to uh, impeach uh, or to start an inquiry looking into the impeachment of President Biden. And uh, Comer went on to to say that he wants answers, that the, the conference wants answers. Congress wants to hear what the Bidens have to say. We have a simple question that I think an overwhelming majority of Americans have. 
What did the Bidens do to receive the tens of millions of dollars from our enemies around the world? And that's James uh, Comer. I also want to cue up this audio we have of Jonathan Turley that's somewhere in this list here uh, because he's got a piece in in the uh, New York Post. And uh, the title of it is Don't Believe Democrat Myths. There's clear evidence for investigating President Biden. I see. Okay. And oh, hold on. My computer is now frozen, folks. It's like a Democrat cyber attack. All right, I'll close that and we'll come back to that at a different time. Anyway, um, and the, the article that he discusses, uh, Professor Turley, talks about how there's way more evidence than 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 the media will let you think there is. And I think that's um, that's important, right? It's important because people are, are, are hearing a barrage of, of clips uh, in the media saying that there is um, no evidence, there's nothing, there's no reason. From Chuck Grassley to, uh, to our friends on the left, they're all saying the same thing. I got no evidence for this. I got no evidence. Can't see why we're doing this, you know. And, and then yet you have all of the other members of the Republican Party voting for that. So obviously they see some evidence, right? Unless they're all in uh, kind of collusion saying, uh, even though there's no evidence, we're going we're gonna to do this to this guy. And again, that wouldn't be um, unprecedented, right? I think that's exactly what happened to Donald Trump when he told the Ukrainians, well, listen, hold on, I need you to hang on. And whatever it was he said, it wasn't necessarily an impeachable offense, but they made it into an impeachable offense and and there we are today. So if they can do that to President Trump, based on I don't know something f- flimsy and frivolous, uh, obviously you could do it. I think to President Biden on a lot more, where it's it's not it doesn't even come close, right? In terms of uh, how many allegations and how severe it is and the money trail and all of that. So anyway, I want to get your thoughts on uh, the next election, how you think that's going to play out as well as this, um, uh, I'm not going to say alleged, I'm going to say potential uh, impeachment of, of Joe Biden. So let's go to uh, Ventnor, New Jersey, WOND, and check in with Shannon. Uh, Shannon, you're on with Rich Valdez. Go right ahead. Hi, Rich. Thanks so much for taking my call. Of course. Well, I'm very concerned about this upcoming election. I mean, here we go again, I guess. You know, Biden and Trump, um, I think morale um, is low. I think that, you know, the, who is suffering is the middle class. I think corporations are just getting richer and, you know, common everyday folk are just, you know, I think they're the ones suffering. You know, meanwhile, this, you know, tit for tat impeachment is going on. Um, it's it doesn't look good, I don't think, on the world stage that, um, you know, we can't really govern ourselves and we're in a gridlock and, you know, it's partisan politics, uh, you know, just, I hate to say it, but partisan politics are tearing this country apart. Um, we need to, you know, focus on like, you know, here I am, I'm 33. Uh, mm-hmm. I fear that I have no, you know, social security to look forward to, um, you know, cost of living is so high and, um, you know, my mom, I love her, but, you know, she's a baby boomer. She doesn't, you know, she, I feel like, um, you know, things were just so much more different for her. You know, the, the track wasn't just, oh, you know, you right. go to college and, you know, she, you know, was able to make a living um, by, you know, not going to college and, you know, working her, her father, you know, was a trucker. He supported a stay at home mom and five kids because of union wow. um, at the time. This was, you know, in the fifties, but I'm just worried that that is all going away. I, you know, um, Mm -hmm. you know, is my generation ever going to be able to retire, um, with any sort of, um, you know, security and and what, what is that going to look like? Um, you know, it's, it's worrying. And, you know, meanwhile, you just have this, you know, Trump and Biden impeach impeachment again, Hunter Biden. Right. It's exhausting. Yes, it really, it really is. And And, and I'm not concerned with it anymore. It sounds to me like you're turned off. Would that be fair to say? 
yes. Um, you know, but of course, still interested. You know, that's some calling in to discuss it. Um, right. I just don't. I don't know quite. I don't think any of this is going to, you know, move any legislation along that's going to help this country. Um, you know, I love this country. I know you do too. Um, and, you know, I know you've experienced in the Christie administration. I, I thought that was very interesting. You know, he's now running for president himself. Um, maybe you had any thoughts on if, if he would be a good leader and, um, you know, your experience with him, maybe. Um, there's something there. It seems like Trump is the shoe in. Yeah, it seems that way to me. Chris Christie. Yeah. So I, I look, I think Chris Christie is a good politician and, uh, and he's a good lawyer. He's a good prosecutor. And, and some people disagree with me, but I think he was uh, a better governor in New Jersey than we would have had uh, with another term of John Corzine uh, for sure. So I, I'm going to go to say he was uh, a good governor. He passed a constitutional amendment to cap property taxes. There were, there were things that, that Christie definitely did that, that were um, noteworthy. He held things together during Hurricane Sandy, and uh, I commend him on all of those things. He had, and he had a lot of um, um, initiatives within the administration to reduce the size of, of spending within the government and, and rein in some of that government power. So all things I applaud. However, I don't see him polling anywhere near where he needs to poll in order to to have the influence that he needs to be able to become president. So I don't think that happens. But with respect to Trump, I think Trump um, does have the the whatever you need, right? The X factor. He's got it, whatever it is. And and I think he's really the 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 best way to go. I think the part of the problem we have is that unlike um, maybe Reagan, but unlike any other president, Trump has been under unrelenting attacks. And I mean, I don't just mean, you know, blow drying his hair and, and uh, you know, and, and going and giving a speech. And, and that's the extent of it. I mean, th- he's been maligned. His kids have been maligned. They've put them in uh, interrogation rooms. They, they've made it very difficult for them to... Um, uh, just exist. And I think that that's part of what you're talking about, right? That's that um, cutthroat nature of politics that uh, we don't necessarily need, but we do necessarily have at the current moment. And lamentably, this is fueled by those that are trying to divide our country, the, the left within the media that wants to see that division so that they can ultimately say, well, you know, look, um, you have a job, you go out on, a week, on the weekends, maybe you go out uh, once or twice a month because you're, you're out with friends and whatnot, and, and you're trying to live your life, and they don't want that, right? They, <laughs> they want to put a kibosh on that. And by, by that I mean this is, this is no longer about one um, doing what they want to do. This is about coercion, right? It's, it's about forcing people to, um, to, to live a certain way. And, and stick with me here, right? I, I'm not saying that Joe Biden's forcing anybody to, to go to dinner with their friends or not go to dinner with their friends. I'm saying his policies are impacting that. Uh, the fact that inflation is where it is makes it a lot more difficult. Right now, you might have to switch from one restaurant to another to accommodate all your friends. But eventually, um, if these policies have their way and they continue, inflation... Um, Inflation, you've got the, the cost of, of certain goods. These things are just out of control. Even gas, again, is, I feel, expensive. I went to get gas today. So, I mean, there's so many things that are going to impact your ability to go out and hang out with your said friends. And to me, that's, that's a bad indicator for, for our economy. It's a bad indicator for where we go from here. And, but that's what's happening. Uh, in in Biden's America and Biden's White House. So I think a lot of people are ready to have um, El Trumpito come back and to make those moves in a, in a way that's kind of uh, very practical. Uh, but I don't think that fixes the problem per se, right? It fixes a part of the problem. Ultimately, you've got people that are, are just um, adamant on trying to persevere and get through, and those are great and we should commend them. But I think there's an equal amount, if not more, uh, people that want to continue to do the status quo. 
And I think that's where it gets tricky because as long as people are happy to just do enough to get by, uh, even take a few steps back and then a foot forward, foot step forward, um, we don't go anywhere. We don't, we don't make any progress. So I think it's important for people like you that are in their thirties that are kind of on the fence, not sure what they want to do. I say, keep taking every shot you've got and uh, do what you got to do and, and, and make it work. And I think ultimately if you vote your conscience, whether it's um, through um, a social issue, whether it's a fiscal issue, whatever it is that's on your mind and on your heart, vote your conscience. And uh, I think that's how we get to where we got to be. Uh, great conversation, by the way, Shannon. Thank you for the call. Call back anytime. I've got to take a quick pause right here, but we're going to come back to the rest of your calls and more straight ahead. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. Rich Valdez, who again will do a fine job, but I know you'll enjoy listening to it. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. All right, to the phones we go. Let's go to Rob Mitchell, South Dakota, listening on KORN. Rob, go right ahead. You're on with Rich Valdez. Hi, Rich. I was just uh, making some pancakes here, and I had a pancake in my mouth, but I'm all better now. <laughs> Who doesn't love pancakes? Idea. <laughs> I was working on this game show idea, something you tell me what you think, come up with a better name. It just while I was waiting, truth or refute, it doesn't really rhyme. But I want a buzzer. I want to be able to chime in when I hear a politician say something I know the facts are a little different on. Maybe we can do a version of that uh, as a segment here. Truth or refute and bring the callers into it and get some sound effects. Like, eh, you know, uh, that sounds like a lot of fun, Rob. A- anyway, what, what's uh, so you want to do this? Who do you want to play it with? Um, the call list that Morgan Ortegas was what happened was I heard part of the list and then I was telling call screener that um, I heard gagging next door and abruptly had to go attend to that. And I thought, how am I going to give this kid CPR? And I remembered I have a toilet plunger because I don't have one of those, you know, face mask things for him. But anyway, so I didn't hear the whole list, but uh, I think it was Mike Rogers. It was a specialist on China policy. And then I forgot the third one or didn't hear the third one, but I think that would be perfect. Like, go go ahead and let her segment play, and then on the side you could run sections of it. Do think, hey, this is a good foreign policy quiz question. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good idea for any radio show, honestly, uh, to to keep it spicy and to to keep it everybody on their toes. Uh, it sounds like a, like a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I think, and I also like the buzzer idea. Honestly, the you know, eh, you're wrong. Um, I, let's, uh, let's, you know, take it to the, uh, fact checker. Who's that? Me. I'm the fact checker, you know, or right, just something funny like that. I think it would be a lot of fun. Now, let me ask you, what's the weather in South Dakota tonight? Uh, it's really nice. You know, it was below 20 degrees, but it comes up and it's been warming up in the forties and sixties. It's crazy. The neighbors still running their air conditioning, if you can believe that or not. And families in Alaska huddled up, you know, and it's, They've got so many snows now that the schools are canceled again. And then you have the other family in Florida, you know, mm-hmm. making the ones in Alaska feel terrible. So, Well, there we have it. Um, I'm being told I have to take a quick break, Rob. Thank you for your call and for the suggestion. I appreciate it. Folks, stick with me. We're coming right back to the rest of your calls and more. Don't go anywhere. This is America at Night with Rich Valdez. With Rich Valdez. All right, America, welcome back. Rich Valdez, 833 4825 337. 833 4 Valdez is the uh, phone number. And let's uh, continue. Let's go to the phones. 
David, San Francisco, California, listening online, Rich Valdez, America at night dot com. David, go right ahead. Oh, thanks, Rich. Uh, you know, the uh, apparently the worst Congress in the history of America was just before the 1929 Depression. They only passed 21 bills. And uh, if I understand right, a couple of them were just naming post offices. So yeah. apparently the, the current uh, Congress passed 22 bills. So they're the second worst Congress for getting anything done. And uh, one of the things that they haven't done is uh, pass a budget. And they're going to delay it after Christmas, putting America at jeopardy. Uh, you know, the, I've lived through a couple of these government shutdowns and people will go out there and spend their Christmas money. And then all of a sudden in January, when they pull these government shutdowns, uh, they find uh, the American public find that they can't don't have enough money to pay their mortgages and they start losing their houses. So sure. I'm urging America to not go out and spend their money until Congress uh, goes and uh, finishes their budget. I'm with you, David. Listen to me. I am supporting everything you're saying 100 percent. I believe that Speaker Johnson took over and he came in and they enacted a continuing resolution that would make sure the government is funded and will avoid a government shutdown. That part is done, but that's nothing that I can applaud. Right. I can't say, oh, great job, uh, because I don't think it's a great job. I think uh, it it was a valiant effort, let's say. But what I believe needs to happen is what you're talking about, a budget. Right. We need to create a budget, submit a budget and vote on a budget and keep it. And instead, we've had um, you know everything under the sun, opinions, everybody, you name it, but not an actual budget. Uh, this continuing resolution and another continuing resolution is really, in my opinion, not the answer, but it's what they've done. And that's where we are, sadly. So uh, I'm in full agreement with you. Um, do what you got to do. Protest what you got to protest. Twist arms as much as you got to twist arms. Do what you got to do to get your member of Congress to um, to address the issue. And the issue, I think, is is the one you're talking about. We need to have a budget. David, thanks for the call. Joe in Salem, Arkansas, KSAR. We've got a minute to go, maybe 40 seconds. Go right ahead. Greetings, uh, Rich, from Salem Province here. Um, Thank you. Listen, uh, a lot of law students, and I'd say you are kind of one, it sounds like, We'll understand the uh, lawful money of account issue. Uh, Missouri and Arkansas has silver, okay, at so many grains, just like the 1792 coinage act. And that's what I used in all my traffic tickets, and I used it in my divorce at the end of the divorce. uh, What'd you pay? Oh, I paid zero. Look at you, zero divorce. That's fantastic. uh, Joe in Salem, Arkansas, KSAR. Good for you paying zero on that. Folks, it's Rich Valdez. Hasta la próxima. Take care. Good night and God bless you, America.